All right, good morning. I forgot my reading glasses, but fear not. I can see your faces. I can recognize you. I'm just not able to read a sticker on Abdu's computer, but that's all. Today, I'm going to remind you that the assignment of this week is not viewing notes. It has a different format. It's called a film essay. And I will continue my discussion of the themes of this week's film, Il Surpasso, and what I'm doing with the film's contents and characters is a model that you can follow with your film essay. But before I continue with that, I'm going to introduce the second of four choices that you have for the final paper and introduce a film from, from 2020 called The Man in the Hat, which is available, I think, free on Prime Video, available also on other platforms, okay? So, as you can see here, at the end of week five, the assignments specify that this week, inside the same Google Docs file, you have to post what I've called a film essay. It's, of course, longer, two or three pages. And there are a few instructions. The main thing about the film essay is that the format is a narrative format, no bullet points. However, it is not exactly a mini paper. Therefore, John commit too much space to a formal introduction or to a conclusion where you summarize your essay. The bulk, the heart of your film essay should be the analysis of one or two themes that are central to this film, that are essential to the understanding of this week's film, Il Sorpasso. And you can borrow the ideas that I have introduced in my analysis. You can focus on just one of the two characters, the main characters in the film, just Bruno or just Roberto. You can focus on their relationship. You can focus on a different kind of theme that encompasses different moments in the film, such as the theme of distance, the way Roberto keeps at a distance from reality, refusing to engage or hesitating when it comes time to engage and act on reality and cause, make a difference, have an impact. Or the opposite of this theme of distance, the theme of closeness. But closeness in the character of Bruno is really, in fact, intrusion, invasion. And I also suggested that one can see this film as something that parallels the structure of the hitchhiker because in many ways, Roberto, the younger character, the law student, is captive to Bruno throughout the film. He's trying to escape, but doesn't have the psychological strength, the courage, or the wherewithal, and you know how it ends. So there is also an element of violence, as there is an element of, which, which is similar to the hitchhiker, this control of the other's body. Remember how Emmett Myers, the criminal in the hitchhiker, is given precise instructions to Roy and Gilbert, telling Gilbert, for example, you have to keep one arm like that, another arm on the front bench, and when we exit the car, you have to exit from this door. You have to stay in this position. In the same way, there are several scenes in which Bruno is controlling Roberto's body. To the point, for example, where in the Trattoria in Civita Vecchia, Bruno is feeding uh, Roberto without telling what is given him with bits of, bits of, of fish uh, probably a piece of calamari from a fish soup 
that Roberto doesn't like in the first place. Okay, so these are some ideas. And instead of trying to cover the whole film of Il Sorpasso in your short essay, you have to simply pick two or three scenes, two or three moments, and provide a more in-depth analysis. The purpose of the film essay, and there will be two more films for which instead of viewing notes you have to provide a film essay, is to prepare for the final paper, which will be the longer format of this kind of essay and this kind of approach that is specific. It's an essay, but it's an essay on the specific themes that are the focus of this class. Themes that have to do with road, the road movie genre, or more specifically with this film. But again, it's not a generic kind of analysis. Okay? So let me move to the next thing for now. I'll go back to Il Sorpasso. Later, I want to show you the page called Films for the Final Paper, which is linked at the bottom of many, many pages, every week, weekly page, etc. Under the second film, the second option for the final paper, The Man in the Hat, directed by two directors, you find, of course, the link to Amazon Prime, which is the easiest way to watch this. You find other options through the website Just Watch. You find this time frames from the whole film taken at two seconds interval, part one and part two, because it's almost 3,000 images from the film. And I have created, in this case, a separate page with ideas and suggestions so that if you pick this film, you have some knowledge of the elements that would be relevant for an analysis conducted in this class, rather than a generic essay on the film. And I'll show you this page today, later today. I've added a series of links to reviews. Of course, if you go to RottenTomatoes.com, you'll find plenty of reviews on this film. I suggest that if you pick one, you read the review found at the RogerEbert.com website. The Guardian has a very short review. It's meaningful, it's smart, but it's very short. And there are a few more that I found interesting, not just reviews, but also blogs. On Internet Movie Database, uh, there is a very short list of the locations. They give you some ideas of where the movie was shot in southern France, but it's very incomplete. I tried to add in my page on the film a few more of the locations, at least those that I could identify. A few more I haven't identified yet. The film had an Instagram uh, account, uh, and if you're curious, you can go and see what other people, for example, you find a video by Stephen Frey talking about the film. And in order to understand a key moment in the film, you have to know about this poem by the French poet Baudelaire from the middle of the 19th century, which is quoted, the main character is writing down the first few lines from this poem. So I've included a translation of thought. I haven't found a good translation of, of this poem. Now, as usual, I'll show you a sequence, and I've picked the initial sequence. I will not say anything to introduce the sequence, because I'm going to talk about the film later, and also because you find uh, lots of information and points for analysis in the specific page for the film. So this is the beginning right after the initial credits. Let me make sure we have the subtitle. Yes. <laughs>
we can lower the shade. The film is in French with subtitles, but really there isn't a lot of dialogues. This is Marseille. But it's not the main port, as you can see. It's a secondary key. And you may have seen the actor Kieran Hines, Irish actor. He acted in Belfast, for example, the film from 2021, and many other films, really. point the film is not as much about the chase and escaping the alleged mafia murderers and it becomes an adventure with multiple encounters with special unique characters and as you can see a certain poetic pre-modern or anti-modern flair to the images the scenes situations and I'll stop here as I said earlier I created a page with suggestions and also I've included screenshots from the frames in the film, even the captions illustrate the significance of what you see in certain frames, the mise-en-scene, the use of certain objects, etc. So the film is a road trip, clearly. It seems to be, because of the, pre the initial premise, part film noir, right? And we will keep seeing the alleged criminals up to the conclusion where they will be revealed not to be so dangerous, in fact. So, in terms of the destinations or goals of the journey made by the protagonist, the man in the hat, what we have in the initial setup is is in southern france in marseille having uh, a good time at a small inn in this secluded small seaport south of the city of marseille south of the downtown area and we know that he has with him is carrying this black and white photo of a young woman so this must be a love connection that he has lost. So either he's there because he met this woman there in the past, or they spent time in southern France, they travel together in that area, and possibly he lost this woman, he might be a widow, a widower, uh, and he's just traveling to put her out of his mind, not to think about her. Right after that, the new destination, the new goal, is to escape these criminals. He has seen them throw into the water near the inn where he's staying something wrapped in black tarp. It is has the elongated shape of a human body. They saw him and therefore he packs his tiny bag, gets into his tiny car, and speeds away as fast as you can on board a Fiat 500, top speed around 65 miles on a good day. Um, of course, there is something somewhat grotesque about the chase. And uh, this is emphasized by the props, by the choice of vehicles. 
even the alleged criminals are driving this uh, car from the 1970s and 80s, very French car, a Citroën Dian, uh, mostly made of plastic, very light, uh, and itself not much faster than the Fiat 500, certainly not when you put five people inside of it. Right after that, the secondary goal, besides trying to escape from the criminals going through various places, locales in France, is to pursue from a distance the woman he meets on the ferry. On the ferry, he looks at her, the woman in the bicycle. They exchange an interesting uh, look. And then they will meet briefly outside a cafe because she is in a cafe by herself before the man in the hat comes in. She leaves her agenda on the counter. And then uh, the, the man in the hat comes inside the cafe, finds the agenda, runs after her, gives her the, uh, the agenda. But they will continue to meet in various places throughout the film. And of course, they will connect at the very end. So those are the secondary, what, the first one is the intended destination, the original, the initial destination, the others are the secondary and the new goals of the trip. Of course, as I said, there is this very Frenchy, cutesy setup for most of the scenes. For example, this very tiny inn with a few tables and is the only customer even though it's September 10th, according to the dates of the newspaper, so it's not exactly off season for this area. Just him and the cat on this dinner, during this dinner. Look at the shot that prepares the premise for the story. On one side, you have this fake, fictional French newspaper, Le Littoral de Provence, the shores of Provence. And the main news article, the, the big title says, Mart Mor Martyr Among uh, Mafiosi, the, the Mafia uh, in Marseille. So allegedly there is a Mafia war in Marseille. So you can think that when you see the man in the black, dress, the black suits throwing something off the docks, you can think this is someone that murdered the enemy member of another gang or an eyewitness, etc. However, there is this grotesque aspect that is infused in several uh, segments of this movie, because if you look at this, and this newspaper is shown uh, in, in quite a few frames, you can see, for example, the really grotesque, grotesque title the news articles mentioned at the very top, which says, hungry seagull tries to carry away a one-year-old uh, from the beach. Okay, And there is another article about mysterious car accidents. So there, is, there are these elements of darkness, film noir elements, but also grotesque elements. Look at the choice of the pictures for the French mafiosi. They look like mug shots from a movie from American movies from, from the 1930s or 40s. So already you see that the movie is not trying to be realistic, right? Next to it, so this is one thread of the film, right? Next to it, you have the other thread, searching for love. A love from the past that will be replaced by a new love. And in the middle, you find, we don't know whether it's liquor or rosé wine, uh, but you find the element of the travel, the, the tourism, enjoying food, meeting people. And in the very background, the most stereotypical tablecloth, the tablecloth that universally in modern cinema tells you this is the Mediterranean. Right, because this is southern France, right? So you're not in the civilized modern world any longer. Okay, and we've seen what happens. 
This is the second encounter in the cafe. And again, it's a mix of old and new because there is a dynamic dialectical uh, interaction between old and new, modernity and anti-modernity. It's not just old-fashioned elements, it's a clash. Because you have this uh, old French customers with a typical beret, right? You have a cozy place, look for example at the ceiling, look at the, the, the industrial style lamps, but when you look more closely, especially on the screen of your computer, because as usual some of the details uh, escape uh, your view uh, with the projector, here you have the stuffed head of an animal, like a deer of a, or a moose, but the animal has dark sunglasses, and in the mouth he has a big joint. And this is more visible even to you. You recognize these guys in this poster to the right? Please, tell me that there is at least one person who knows about them. The Blues Brothers, and those would be oh, uh, actors. And yeah, you've got your extra credit coming. <laughs> this is a famous movie from 1980 or 1981, and it's an extremely paradoxical movie with dark elements, which is in some ways a spoof on the theme of the film noir. Okay? So, Already you have this weird, whimsical mix of old and new, realistic and surreal. I uh, included a section on Jacques Tati, who was a famous French uh, actor, uh, director, and producer. He won an Oscar in the 1950s. Um, and the film clearly follows some of the staples in the style of Jacques Tati, both for acting and filming. But I'll leave, I'll leave these notes to you. I'll just show you some of the elements that are reminiscent of Jacques Tati. The idea that uh, there is this surreal ingeniousness whereby characters become very inventive about simple problems. In this case, well, first of all, notice how he took out the chair from the Fiat 500 and he's using it as a picnic chair than using the uh, uh, front lid of the car, the engine is in the back, uh, as a table of sorts. But while he's eating sardines from a can, some of the oil of the sardines and that ends up on his blue shirts, so what does he do? He cuts out the part of the shirt with the stain, then he paints the, the, the shirt underneath with the same color, puts it back, and everything is fine. And this is the kind of clownery that is typical of the films with Jacques Tati, combined with the fact that even in the films with Jacques Tati, there is very little dialogue, and it's mostly sounds, uh, miming, etc. Another element a la Jacques Tati, he finds himself uh, at a red light and green doesn't come. Everyone is getting impatient. There is a long line of cars. What does he decide to do? He grabs a crystal ball, which was in fact a fancy award given to him because in one of the episodes he's mistaken for a famous professor of crystallography opens a can of tomatoes, peeled tomatoes, throws the tomatoes in, in the crystal ball, takes an electric heater, and makes tomato soup in the car while waiting for the green light. Again, it's kind of clownish, surreal, and reminiscent of the film produced and directed by Jacques Tati. Of course, the places are all places that are non-modern or even anti-modern, or where you see the clash between modernity and pre-modernity. This is La Camargue, so rivers, canals, the only modern elements, these uh, uh, wind turbines that you can see 
on the shores of France, uh, uh, Italy, other European countries, and so to become here. And of course, this is the car of the alleged mafia criminals from Marseille, following Chase and Ham. Plenty of bridges, they're always ancient bridges, medieval bridges. Underneath one of them, you find another character with no name but a nickname. He's called the Damp Man because he lives under the bridge and is always damp. His clothes are wet, his food is wet, his face, his head is wet. And um, this is the man in the hat. He's just dropped the hat. This is his car. Drop the hat in the river, so he's coming down to get his hat, and he will meet uh, the man, uh, the damp man, and continue on his trip there. At some point, meandering through southern French, uh, uh, France, at some point, the man in the hat will find this barrier. Uh, it seems to be a customs post or, or station, and I include a link to explain how this is a throwback to the past. In the 19th century, traveling through France, you would have found these places where customs officers inside the country, not at the borders, inside the countries would have stopped you because there were local taxes. So if you were carrying anything with a commercial value, even within the, Fra the country of France, you would have had to pay a nominal fee uh, at these gates. So it's kind of a forgotten piece of the past, right? A Customs, post, or station in a place where there is no border. And of course, you can see also how old the village and how small the village is. Uh, plenty of outdated vehicles. Of course, you've seen the Fiat 500, the Diane, the Citroën Diane. Uh, and here you have a tandem bicycles, right? Uh, again, throwback to the past. Everything is presented in an essential and poetic way. This is the lunch of the man in the hat while when he is listening to the story of the young widow who uh, falls in love with his husband's twin brother and then the female dog comes in between them, goes to the cemetery, digs up the bones of her master, but they find that the grave is an empty hole and the uh, uh, husband who escaped from the mafia went to Algeria, comes back, but picks the dog uh, over the wife. But look at how essential this is. Five pieces of herrings, herring, uh, smoked herring, uh, a slice of lemon, and if you can please identify this kind of salad I've tried, but I'm not sure I got it right. So it's not just any kind of herb. Right? It's very a very particular choice. Or at the end of the film, when the man in the hat is on a ferry, on a ship going back from Dunkirk, France, to England, look at the stamping tools by the customs officer, which incidentally is the same officer we found earlier. This is the kind of stuff I would have found on my father's desk in the 1970s, right? My father worked in a state office. And this is a piece of paper with the first few lines of a poem by uh, Charles Baudelaire uh, called Invitation to Travel. And it talks about travel and being together socially. So it combines the idea of traveling and discovering new forms of familiarization or socialization, which becomes eventually the theme of the second part of the film, together with themes that are connected to it, such as solitude. Look at these three tables. Look at the disposition of the tables, the lack of interaction between the customers. Of course, we have the man in the hat with his hat on the table. We find a woman in the bicycle, but he's not talking to her. He's pursuing her from a distance. And you find the old man in love, and, and he is the protagonist of a micro story in the film, whereby he has this passionate uh, night 
of sex with another woman, an old woman, but in the morning they have to separate, they cannot be together. So estrangement, solitude, looking for love, all these themes are found throughout the movie. This is a damp man being carried over, etc. And, and I have to, to stop, but you find plenty of notes in here, including comments on specific frames. Besides the storytelling, the short stories or novellas or fairy tales that are being told by a character to another at some point, you also find a series of visual micro stories, stories that are being simply told, uh, narrated through images without dialogue at all. And this is a, a good example of that. A tall priest dressed very traditionally on the side of the road under a tree and the man in the hat gives him a ride and you see how tall he is compared to the small car even though you can fit someone as tall as me 6'1 inside a Fiat 500 and he gets out through the uh, standard sunroof of, of the car and starts removing his hat, his robe, he's finally free, finally enjoying life. And this goes on for a little while, and then the Fiat is passed by this fancy new uh, uh, Renault van with full of nuns that are dressed impeccably, very formally, and they wait by the side of the road. They stop, the priest knows that his moment of freedom is over, very dejected, he walks to them, they're holding the robes, they're uh, holding his priestly garments, and there it is, going back to his role, but looking back with nostalgia to the moment of freedom he enjoyed in the company of the man with the hat. At some point, the man in the hat, in another micro story, will lose a, a shoe, and as a consequence, with only one shoe, he will become an outcast, a homeless person. He will try to get into a restaurant or a cafe. People will say, will point at the shoe and say, no, you cannot come here. He'll end up sleeping on the bench until the shoe store in the village opens and he can get his shoe back. Okay. So let me go back for the next 10 minutes to Il Sorpasso and the page that I had prepared with frames to illustrate the themes. And again, you can pick any of these themes, but don't pick more than one or two for your film essay that is due on Sunday. And one of the themes that is central in this film is the theme of frustration. The characters are moving from place to place but this, at the same time, they're constantly disappointed. And this prompts their desire, reinforces their desire to go somewhere else and find some kind of satisfaction uh, or fulfillment of ha or happiness somewhere else. In this case, Bruno and Roberto are at the small villa on the shores of Tuscany where Gianna, Bruno's wife, his strange wife, lives. And here you see Bruno, and, and look at the face of Bruno. It's an unusual kind of look uh, because he's, he's afraid. He's hesitating, but clearly he's trying to go, get into the bed with his wife. They haven't been together as husband and wife for at least six years, according to the uh, story in the film. And he's trying to have sex with her, not because he's in love with her, but because he thinks that having sex would express Gianna's approval of him. The face that you see on Bruno is motivated by the fact that Gianna is very self-sufficient, very strong. She does not need Bruno. She knows that Bruno is immature, shy, childish, destructive, and he handles him in a way that Roberto is not able to. That is to say, he's not simply sending him away, but she's very careful around him, and of course she will refuse to engage in sex, 
and Bruno will be so humiliated that he leaves the room, goes to another bedroom where Roberto is about to get to sleep, and he says, let's, let's leave. And they will end up spending the night uh, on a chase lawn in the beach as a consequence. In reference to frustration, another uh, ex manifestation of this theme is the relationship between Lily, the daughter of Bruno and Gianna, and Bruno himself. Of course, Bruno has not been a father to her, has been largely, mostly absent in her life. They, they try to reconnect, right? Bruno is saying, why not come stay with me a while in Rome? And she uh, moves closer to him in, in some ways, for example, by uh, telling uh, her mother that Bruno looks like a winner. Of course, he looks like a winner, but he's not a winner, right? He's a loser. And even though it seems like they're reconnecting briefly during this day in Castiglioncello, Tuscany, on the, the shores of Tuscany, by the end, before, when, when the time comes for Bruno and Roberto to leave again, get on the road again, he would like to say goodbye to his daughter. He would like to strengthen the promise that they will keep in touch, yet he learns that the daughter has left on a yacht. She went out to sea without telling him, without saying goodbye, without saying anything. So the daughter is as cruel as he is, and everything in his life is fake, momentary, right? Nothing is solid, rooted. Nothing is the foundation for a future. Of course, the biggest disappointment of them all is the ending, right? And keep in mind that within the team of produ the production team, the director and the producers, there were different minds. Many of the producers didn't want the film to end with Roberto's death. They thought that this would ruin the chances of this film at the ticket office because they wanted to present it as a lighter kind of comedy because that was the genre that was being successful uh, during those years, where in 1962. And the director said, no, we're going to shoot this, and then we'll decide. And of course, they kept the ending. And it's the perfect finale. It's the perfect conclusion. Roberto's death, right? It represents the impossibility of Bruno as a model. Right when Roberto is acting like Bruno, saying, faster, faster, and Bruno himself is not as confident. Because you see Bruno touching with horns, with this apotropaic gesture, very Italian gesture, that wards off the evil eye and any evil forces and misfortune in general, bad luck in general. You see Bruno touching the horn he keeps in the car. The horn is another amulet typical of this Italian belief in the evil eye and evil forces. If you have a horn, especially a red horn around you, then you are protected from evil influences of all kinds. So Roberto is turning into Bruno. Bruno himself is not fully Bruno at that moment. And then you have the accident and Roberto dies. And you have this very cruel thing, right? If you remember, if you've seen the film, the police comes and asks Bruno who the victim was down the cliff in the capsized car. And he says, his name was Roberto. I don't know his last name. And of course, they were introduced, right? They introduced it in the apartment. They, tell, they told each other their last name, Roberto Mariani, Bruno Cortona. But it's not about Bruno's short memory. It's about Bruno's inability to connect in any deep, meaningful way with another human being. Because it may seem like Bruno is right in the middle of the action, right in the middle of life, always intruding, always invading, but is not really putting down any roots in that reality, always moving away. So mobility is, to Bruno's character, what distance and shyness and hesitation is to Roberto's character. Roberto is shy and always keeping away from his goal, love, career, success, it, social interactions of all kinds. Bruno is always in the midst of all that, yet his mobility makes him distant, 
in a way that parallels uh, Bruno's profile and attitude. I added another section, in fact two, one with frames about the theme of old and new in Italy. I don't have time to go through them, but you're welcome to look at those frames. In this frame, for example, you see one of the themes in the film, the fact that the road is the new piazza. The road is a new place for public interaction. You're not just driving. While you're driving, Bruno is constantly interacting with other people from other vehicles. And the piazza is a public place in Italy, right? Very important where you dress up, you're going to see other people and be seen, right? According to a traditional approach to public life in Italy, when I was growing up, no one would go to a supermarket in their pajamas, as you can see in the Upper West Side or in Long Island City, right? Uh, even just to go and buy a box of pasta, you change into formal clothing because you're going to public place, you're going to be seen. The same happens with some mutations for the road. There you're being judged by the way you drive, the vehicle you drive, etc. And of course, your gestures, your public gestures, the way you behave. And of course, Bruno is very domineering. He's trying to dominate with his driving his, and passing. is trying to dominate over the others. I'll stop here because it's almost time. Let me know if you need any help, especially now. Remember that you have a film essay, not viewing notes, different format. So let me know between now and Friday if you need any assistance with that kind of assignment.